Good evening. We welcome you to our third midweek worship service as we're already getting incredibly or perhaps even frighteningly close to the day of Christmas. And so as if you're just joining us today, we encourage you to write in peace be with you in the comments section and that'll help other people know that uh, you're thinking about them and it's a great opportunity to witness once, once again to the peace that we do have in Jesus Christ with one another. If you're new to us, uh, we especially thank you for worshiping with us today. And we'll put a link in the comments section, as we always do, for how you might be able to get uh, in contact with our church and ask any questions you might have. And uh, we would love to hear from you. In fact, right now, as you're watching this, uh, perhaps you can go ahead and write into the comments section where you're watching this from. And uh, it'd be great to hear from one another that way in this time where uh, fellowship is taken on a different sort of angle, uh, where we're not able to see each other in person, but uh, we can still extend warm greetings and have a little bit of conversation with one another. So as far as announcements go, I really only have one thing for you. Christmas Eve is coming. It's coming. Uh, and so, and we're going to be ready because uh, we have a few in-person services and a couple times that our online service is going to premiere. So uh, I point you to our email, to our social media, to our website to find out more about those times. But I just want to announce to you now that the RSVP is open. Uh, we're going to have two candlelight services on Christmas Eve, and we're also going to have a daytime service. And we'll have a online service that's actually going to uh, premiere in the morning at 10 a.m. So maybe that's before some of your uh, gatherings begin. Maybe that's before you get a little too heavy into, into uh, cooking and baking and all that stuff that you might be doing on Christmas Eve. And uh, then we'll also have that same online service uh, premiere again uh, at 7 p.m. Uh, it'll be so good, you'll want to watch it twice. And so anyhow, um, as we jump into our service today, uh, we're continuing our, our sermon series on can't wait, can't wait. Uh, again, we're, we're talking about things that um, we can't wait for, things that excite us. On, on Sunday, we've been talking, we talked about how we're waiting for our praise uh, and our joy to grow. And today we're going to be talking about, once again, about the servant in Isaiah and uh, how perhaps, uh, again, we are uh, a little bit afraid of his coming. Um, maybe it's because we, we feel that, that God views us as a burden or something like that. And so in this sense, we can't wait because we're uh, afraid of what he might say to us uh, when he does finally come. So we're going to get into that a little bit more uh, with our sermon. But we're going to begin our worship service today with our opening hymn, Come Thou Fount. How I 
confess our sins. We have grown tired of waiting, Lord. We have expected you to work according to our timeline. When you do not deliver us from our troubles, we become impatient with you. We have become weary with the bad news the year has brought us. While we have been waiting for your salvation, our hearts have grown bitter towards those who have done harm to us and to our nation. We confess that we have shown a lack of love and forgiveness in our waiting. We confess that our trials have threatened the peace that we have in you. We confess that in some ways we dread the future even though you are in control. Forgive us for our impatience and for all other sins. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, when the fullness of time had come, sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. In a world filled with bad news, he remains faithful to his promises. His son's death and resurrection has given you a hope and a future. You are forgiven and restored as children of God. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. We sing our Advent Gloria, Hark the Glad Sound. Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 42, and it will be read by our elder for tonight, Scott Ordahl. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 42. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth, and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. 
I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 8. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we, are, we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand wherever you are and uh, for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We sing our sermon hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Thy people sing, 
and give them victory over the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to Day spring from on high and cheer us by thy drawing night. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and as dark shadows. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. Our sermon text today is from Isaiah chapter 42, verse 4. So if you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open it up to that. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 4. And it reads like this. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. If you have a smoldering wick and you need light and warmth, you're most likely to take that smoldering wick and bring it into a stable environment, get it out of the wind and out of the rain, get some fuel going so that that smoldering wick will be stabilized and then keep adding fuel so that that smoldering wick will become a great fire so that you and everyone around can enjoy its light and its warmth. But that's not what God does. 
God sent a servant to us. And that servant is described in verse 3 of Isaiah 42 as a bruised reed. He will not break. A faintly burning wick. He will not quench. He will be faithful and bring forth justice. This servant will be a faintly burning wick, and yet he will not grow faint or be discouraged. So go ahead. Let only a few follow him, and let him at other times watch loud, large crowds abandon him. Let him look up at the heavens in frustration at times because it seems like nobody understands all that he has been teaching. Let his enemies come against him. Let them pick up rocks. Let him try, let them try to carry him to the edge of the town and throw him off a cliff. Let them try to catch him in his words. Let them gossip about him at, gossip about him at night and let them attack him by day. Let Satan try to lead him into one temptation after another and watch him walk through completely unscathed. Let him hear that voice, that nagging voice every night. You're not enough. You're going to mess up. You can't do it. But let him wake up each morning and put one foot forward in front of the other. He will not be discouraged. And that's great news because it means also that he won't be discouraged by you. Maybe you've heard in your life before someone tell you that you're a burden on others and you've come to believe that God also views you as a burden as well. Maybe you've been told before that you are annoying and maybe you've come to believe that God sees you that way too. Maybe you've been told in your life that you are just a drain on other people and you've come to believe that God views you the same way too. The servant of God will not be discouraged by you. This means not that, that whenever he sees you being a burden or whatever else, that he can just kind of keep going around you and not have to deal with you and in that way not be discouraged. No, it means that he's not discouraged in his work to save and redeem you. The Apostle Paul tells us that it was for the joy set before him that he took up the cross, scorning its shame. It was for the joy set before him. Christ, the servant of God, came, and he is not discouraged or burdened, or worn out by you. But instead, he has gladly come to save you. But the news about Jesus gets even bigger. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 4 says that the coastlands wait for his law. The coastlands, we could say, wait for his teaching. Now, I'm not going to blow you away with my geographical knowledge, but... When we're talking about coastlands, we know that these are the furthest reaches of the earth. Literally. If you build a house on a beach, that's one thing. But if you go out any further, you're building a house in the water. And that's generally a bad idea. And so if you walk across the land and you get to the coastlands, that's as far as you can go. That's as far as people can dwell. If you go to the other side of the land, you'll get to another coast. And that's as far as they can dwell. And so the servant of God is coming for people on the coastlands and everyone in between. It says in verse 6 that he'll be a light to the nations. And it says in verse 7 that he has come to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. He has come for those who feel furthest away from God. He has come for those who feel the most sorrow and despair and worry and trouble in their hearts. He has come for the weak and the helpless, those who have been held captive by the power of death for a long time. And he is not discouraged by any of it. 
There are millions of people right now who have been told one way or another that they are a burden. Either it's because their employers have told them that they can't come back to work due to difficult circumstances, and yet it still feels like rejection. There are those who have been told that they can no longer live in their house or their apartment because they can no longer afford to. There are those who have been given very little time by doctors and nurses, and so perhaps they feel as if all the good treatments are passing them by. One way or another. There are millions of people, perhaps more so than what we've seen in, in, in many decades, who feel that they are a discouragement, they are a burden, and yet Christ comes for even the furthest away, one foot in front of the other. A bruised reed he won't break, a faintly burning wick he will not be quenched. So when God looks out over the world and he sees all of these smoldering wicks, all of those who are struggling, all of those who find themselves trying to get by without being a burden unto others, all those who are believing terrible things about themselves and about their future and about how God regards them, what does he do when he sees all of these smoldering wicks? Does he take them and put them in a stable environment? Does he take them and give them more fuel? Does he take them and build them up into a big old fire? No. He takes all of these smoldering wicks and he gives them a smoldering wick. But this wick is different. You see, the people of Israel a long time ago had rejected God. And when they had done so, they had also cast off the status that God had given them as his servant, as his servant to all the nations. And so God took the hopes and the promises of, of the gospel and he put them into one person, one servant, one human being, Jesus Christ. And he made him a dimly burning wick. But this wick is upheld by the Spirit. And the Spirit, as we know from Isaiah 11, carries many blessings. The Spirit gives wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and fear of the Lord. This burning wick would have the Spirit of God so that he might not be quenched, so that he might not go out, not until the job was done, not until the task was finished. On the night that he was born, it's like the hymn says, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And he gladly carried all those hopes and fears that would weary and stress out so many other people to the point that they would break, but he did not break. And he carried them all the way to the cross where he died for all the burdens of the world. And in his resurrection and in his ascension, we see that, that he has poured out his spirit upon us. That even in the midst of our difficulties, even in the midst of our discouragements, even in the midst of feeling like a great burden unto others, he continues to pro provide life for his weakly burning flames, for his people that seem as if they're about to go out, and yet they don't. Because God has put a spirit upon his servant. And now his servant, Jesus Christ, has given you his spirit as well. So that in your weakness, what's actually being revealed is not that you are a burden, but instead in your weakness, the strength of God is being revealed. We have this spirit from him so that surely, just like he did, we will not go out. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, when we feel our own weakness, we tend to come to believe that we are a burden. We ask that you would pour out your spirit upon us to lift us up, that we might know that you genuinely love us, 
that you're not discouraged by us, but you sent your son Jesus to die, rise again, and give his spirit to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, when we feel weakness in our own bodies, when we feel illness or injury strike, or whenever we feel the pain of spiritual or emotional or mental illness, we want to hide it. We want to cover it up. But instead, Lord, let us know that even in our weakness, you reveal strength. You reveal your grace, which is sufficient for us through every trial. We ask that you would bring healing to those who are feeling ill in any way, as we name them in our hearts before you now. And Almighty Father, whenever we feel our own grief over loved ones who have passed away, it's hard sometimes to talk about it. It's hard to find somebody to unburden ourselves before. We give you thanks that your son hears and that he himself knows grief. We pray for those who grieve that they might lift up their eyes to the heavens and look forward to your son's return, that they might have a little bit of joy mingled with all their sorrow. Lord, we pray for the grieving, especially those that we name in our hearts before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Almighty God, we ask that you would bless our nation in a time of division and a time of despair. We pray that you would bring us healing we ask that you would unite us uh, where we are divided. We pray also that you would bless President Trump uh, as he continues uh, to fulfill his role as president and also for President-elect Joe Biden uh, as he prepares to take office. We ask that you would grant to each a spirit of wisdom and compassion and a spirit of leadership. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, we ask, of course, that you would take this pandemic away from us. As we have gone through these long months, we have cried out to you and we pray, Lord, that you would hear our cry and our prayer. We give you thanks that it seems as though a vaccine has been successful in the early goings. And we pray that that would continue to be true. We pray that you would bless all researchers and, and those who are responsible for designing these vaccines, that they might do so uh, with the patients uh, who suffer from this virus in mind, with hearts filled with compassion, and with hearts that also seek the truth. Lord, we also pray for uh, those who are working on the front lines, that you would guard and protect them from this virus, that you would bring healing to those who suffer from it already. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we conclude our prayers with the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. On closing prayer tonight, as it has been throughout the other weeks of Advent, is the song of Simeon. Simeon had been waiting a long time to see the Christ, and when he finally laid eyes onto him, he burst out into the words of the song that we're about to sing now.
Let's try and resounding through all eternity. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Well, we thank you again so much for joining us this evening. Uh, we hope that this worship service was a blessing to you. And if it was, please share this with others. We don't know what the word of God will do. Uh, and so perhaps somebody really needs to hear this message and the spirit will work through that. And with that, uh, we invite you once again uh, to join us for our Christmas Eve service services. This was our final midweek service of Advent. But of course, uh, we've got a big night coming up on Thursday. Um, we'd love to see you online or in person for that. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.